This, for us, is how contact begins. Say good day to you this day of your time. How are you all? <laughs> all right, thank you. Once again, we will thank each and every one of you individually and all of you together collectively for the co-creation of this interaction and the allowance of this transmission. It is always an opportunity and a gift and a blessing for us to experience through each of you another facet of the multidimensional crystal of creation. So we thank you for this opportunity of sharing. Is it possible that Earth is being contacted telepathically by extraterrestrial beings through channeling? Based on my experience, it's possible that I've been channeling such a being for the past 30 years. Of course, no one has to believe anything in this film. Sometimes I can hardly believe this happened to me. But whether anyone believes my story or not, it'll never change the fact that it's true. First contact between Earth and extraterrestrials has been imagined in literature and cinema for generations, usually in scenarios that depict our fate with blood-curdling terror. In more recent times, with a few exceptions, our films about ET contact have evolved from fear-based stories to ones laced with cautious optimism and sometimes even hope. For the past several decades, organizations such as SETI the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, have been scanning the skies with powerful radio telescopes, listening for transmissions from other civilizations. Aside from a few anomalous signals that remain unexplained, there is still no hard evidence of radio communication from an alien society. But what if ETs have evolved beyond such technology and no longer use radio to communicate? What if they never did? What if alien messages are being delivered in a truly alien way instead, such as telepathy? But why would an ET civilization choose telepathy to communicate? Wouldn't a radio transmission or some form of written language be simpler? It may seem easier to us, but without the proper emphasis or context, the message may have more than one meaning. As in this example, a woman without her man is nothing. A woman. Without her, man is nothing. There's a little bit of a misunderstanding or a little bit of a contradiction in our society about the idea of alien contact. You always hear scientists say, well, look, aliens are going to be very alien and they're going to act in ways that are very different than the way we act. And yet when you propose the possibility that they might actually communicate with us through channeling, they'll go, no, 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 they're going to do it by radio waves. Well, how mundane is that? I mean, that's very human. So I think the idea that from Bashar's point of view, if they have the ability to somehow work with someone that can be trained to act as a biological receiver, in a way it's much more efficient because not only are you getting the language translated, you're getting the idioms of the culture, you're getting the body language, there's a much more 3D holistic expression of the translation coming through a person than there is through a radio. We are often asked, 
throughout the course of these transmissions from many of you the question, what is my purpose in life? Passion is your purpose in life. Your purpose is passion. If someone what had told me mean? I'd wind up being a channel it for an extraterrestrial entity, I'd have thought they were crazy. Expression? But here I am. These kinds of things aren't supposed to happen in the real world. But it did happen, and from that moment on, I knew the world was bigger and far stranger than I was taught to believe. People say truth is stranger than fiction. Mark Twain said, why shouldn't truth be stranger? After all, fiction has to make sense. Was my UFO encounter a sign of things to come, not just for me, but for humanity as well? I don't have all the answers yet, but as I continue to explore my relationship with Bashar, my thoughts keep going back to the beginning, back to 1973, to the day that changed. Two bright lights hovering over a hotel in the distance. What? What, 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 is, what that? is that? Hey. It's weird. It's not a plane. Uh, no. You guys see this? I remember looking out the window of the car, and I remember a large triangular shape. It was dark gray, and it just sort of sat there. It was striking in how symmetrical and how exact the triangle it was. I saw lights in the corner, you know, some bluish white lights in each corner, and some smaller lights on the edges, and those were helping us define it, you know, in the sky. So, uh, and for me, I remember it looked just like a, a rack you used for uh, racking oh, yeah. pool balls mm -hmm. on a pool table. When we ever travel together, it's usually very jovial, very joking mood. And I remember uh, it being very quiet and very contemplative and very serious after that, because uh, like I say, everybody was just kind of struck by what they had seen. It didn't feel dangerous. It just felt like it's the unknown, you know? It's very odd when you, when you can't find an answer. You know that you've seen something, there is no answer, and you're kind of left with these dots that you can't connect. And it's your own experience and trying to share it with other people. Uh, you just can't do it. You have to be there to see it. Hey, do you see? Oh my God, that's—is that the one from last week? It looks here like goes, here it. Goes. Okay, right here. Turn, turn, turn. Can I prove that the ship was Bashar's craft? No, of course not. I can't even prove that it came from another world. But if we have the ability to create that kind of technology, a ship that can hover silently and take off like a speeding bullet without any visible means of propulsion and without making a sound, then somebody has been able to keep that technology a complete secret from the public for the past 40 years since the sighting. Let's assume for the moment that the unidentified flying object they witnessed was, in fact, an extraterrestrial spacecraft. If so, it raises several questions. How is it possible for ETs to travel hundreds of light years to Earth? Why do so many reports of ET beings say they look similar to us? If they are here, why don't they land openly and make contact? This documentary will address these questions and many others. But the answers may be far more unexpected than we imagine. Channeling, UFOs, and ETs have been controversial subjects for decades, sparking heated debates between believers and debunkers. 
Of course, no photo or film can offer absolute proof that such things are real. However, some of the information introduced by Bashar, the ET being reportedly channeled by Daryl Anka, has already impacted the lives of thousands of people around the globe since 1984. These messages contain new insights and perspectives regarding the nature of consciousness, theories of physics, and possibly a glimpse into a larger reality. The only thing required for this journey is an open mind. The first question, what exactly is channeling? Channeling is a natural altered state. I think we all have the ability to do it. I think we all do do it from time to time. If somebody is doing what they love to do, following their passion, in the zone, that's a channeling state. When you're doing something and you're totally caught up in it and you're not paying attention to the passage of time, it seems like five minutes has gone by, you look up, it's been three hours. That's a channeling state. A painter who paints a painting, who's focused on that and nothing else, a singer that's lost in the song, an actor who becomes the character, an athlete at the peak of their performance, a teacher passionate about educating students, that's one of the things that's most important to me is to demystify this whole concept of what channeling is because it is not outside the realm of normal human experience. We do it all the time. Channels and mediums have existed in many cultures for thousands of years. The oracle at Delphi is one famous example in ancient Greece. The people of that time would rely on such seers and mystics for guidance in both personal and worldly matters. The Bible tells the story of King Saul who asked a medium in the city of Endor to call upon the spirit of the prophet Samuel for advice. In more modern times, a psychic called Edgar Cayce, known to many as the Sleeping Prophet, delivered thousands of messages and information while in trance. Today, that information is archived at the Association for Research and Enlightenment in Virginia Beach. Many point to a woman named Jane Roberts as the first modern channel who, in the 1960s, is said to have brought through a spirit entity known as Seth. It is only when you do not know yourself that you fear you are evil and afraid to look within yourself. But when you open up those doors, you are amazed by the immensity and the goodness of your own being. One day, I was introduced to a channel named Tom Massari at a public channeling event. I went to listen for a while, and I thought the information was very interesting, and I, I thought it was very helpful information that seemed to have the ability to help people make positive changes in their lives. And eventually, the entity actually offered to teach a channeling class, and I thought, well, how is that possible? I thought channeling was something that just happened to someone. I didn't think it was something you could teach or learn. I went into the class not because I thought I was going to become a channel, but just because I wanted to further my research. However, during one of the guided meditations in the class, I experienced what I can only call a telepathic contact from Bashar and his people. And in that one instant, a memory actually came back of having made an agreement before this life with Bashar to do this channeling with him. I understood in that instant that the UFO had been shown to me by him on purpose to get me to start learning start questioning, start finding out what was going on, and it led me to learn about channeling so that when the time came to fulfill the agreement I had made to channel Bashar, I would be ready. I'd have enough information so that I wouldn't be scared. I would know how to move forward. I would understand that channeling was beneficial to people. So I, you know, thought, well, first, I don't know, am I hallucinating? I mean, is this a side effect of the meditation? Is this real? Is it my imagination? But in that one instant this was going on in my head, I wasn't telling anyone, the entity coming through the teacher stopped talking to the class and turned right to me and said, there is an entity here for you right now if you're ready to begin. That was startling. And even more startling, I glanced over and I saw that one of the other classmates somehow had picked up on the image of Bashar I saw in my head. And she was actually sketching it on a piece of paper. And I realized, okay, you know, this is not just my imagination. There's two outside validations here that something real is happening. The question that remained though, was Bashar really a separate entity or was I just tapping into another aspect of my own consciousness? Either way, 
I realized that if I pursued the channeling, I would be exploring uncharted waters. Along with the events in the class, the UFO sighting suggested that Bashar might truly be an independent entity. But mainstream society and the media usually ridicule people who report UFOs. What would they say if I said that an alien was speaking through me? At the end of the class, I was approached by a woman named Margot Chandley, and she was writing a doctoral thesis on the connection between channeling and psychology. And I became one of the subjects that she studied uh, for her paper. So she would invite me to her house, and she would invite friends over, and I would channel for them while she took notes in order to write her thesis. Well, the first week there were five friends. And then the next week there were 10 friends. And word of mouth started to spread that this was going on. And then there were 20 friends and 30 friends. And before we knew it, I had to start channeling twice a week to accommodate everyone. And eventually, we had to start holding public events in order to handle the crowds. And word of mouth kept spreading. So eventually, I found myself channeling in cities all over the world. Um, and so really, my public channeling career started in 1984 with Margot. Did I choose this path from a higher level of existence before I entered this life, as Bashar has proposed? When I think about it, there were hints and signs. Most were subtle, but one in particular stands out. When I was little, we lived in this old West Hollywood apartment building. One day, Dad was at work, Mom was in the kitchen, and I was playing by myself in the living room. Suddenly, this small, swirling whirlpool of light appeared and floated in front of me in midair. It just hung there. I remember being transfixed and feeling like it was some kind of window to somewhere else. I didn't actually hear a voice, but it felt like someone was sending me a message from the other side of the light. Looking back now, I wonder if that moment is where my journey really began. When Daryl first made his connection to Bashar and started to channel, it was a little challenging for him because of Bashar's intense energy. And as I watched Daryl work to get out of the way to let Bashar's energy come through, I realized that it was just Bashar's passion and excitement and bringing through the ideas that he wanted to share. But most of all, I loved his humor. I'm a member of a SETI do you know SETI? Yes, we understand. Search for extra Here I am. <laughs> Search over. What do you think is funny about us? What isn't? <laughs> I'm such a dreamer. What does that mean? I dream of meeting my true love. Uh, you dream of meeting your true love. Look in a mirror. <laughs> <laughs> This question's a bit uh, eccentric, but um, a bit I was wondering, ex excent uh, different. A bit eccentric? A bit, yes. <laughs> because talking to an alien through a human is not eccentric enough. Do you have films in your reality? No, we just come watch you. OK. <laughs> Before I started working with Bashar, I had a very traditional work life. I had careers in banking and finance, as a university professor, and also as a psychological counselor. In 1985, as part of my exploration of psychology, I happened upon a lecture being given by Bashar at an expo. Upon hearing him speak, I was so amazed at the clarity and the cutting edge nature of the psychological information he was providing. From that point forward, my life moved in the direction of bringing together all of my business experience, all of my teaching experience, and all of my counseling experience into one form of work that incorporated everything that I had learned. I became so passionate about sharing Bashar's information as a way of helping to improve the lives of both the people and the animals on our planet. While it's possible, for a channel to filter or color a telepathic message, I think the most important thing is to focus on the message rather than the messenger. Is the information empowering or is it controlling? Is it love-based or fear-based? Is it integrative or disconnecting? 
is it positive or negative? I feel that the bottom line is use the information that works for you, that speaks to your heart, and just leave the rest behind. The channeling class taught me to alter my brain waves to match Bashar's frequency. He does the same thing on his ship, and somewhere in the middle, our vibrations meet and harmonize. When they do, my body becomes like a biological resonator, and my personality starts to mirror his. That's an EEG cap, and it's going to be recording your brain waves as we measure various states that we'll be exploring today. And looking up here, we can see that each of the electrodes that we have hooked up on that cap have achieved a level of impedance that is accurate and that will properly record the brainwaves without interference. In the beginning of the channeling, the channel was capable of uh, holding on to, shall we say, or bringing through the idea of about 1.5 to 2% of our energy. In the ensuing years following the initiation of contact with the channel, it was thus then capable in the channel's body of expressing our energy up to about 3%. On average now, we are expressing about 5% of our total energy. So we're looking at a picture of Daryl's baseline EEG. And what I've done is to record Daryl's baseline when he is not channeling and compare that to his EEG when he is channeling. Now here is a picture of Daryl's raw EEG, baseline again, in which we see a very rounded and rhythmic dominant frequency, we call it, in the posterior cortex or the back of the head. And this is a good finding, it's a positive finding, because it tells us that Daryl's nervous system is stable and also that he has what we call good thalamocortical functioning. And this is a common feature, a characteristic, that is found in individuals who are peak performers. So here we have a picture of what disconnects when Daryl begins to channel. And you can see the areas in blue, the functional Broadman areas we call them, um, that are not used when he is channeling. And it appears that he disconnects from his personal sense of self, he disconnects from the experience of pain. Now what increases when he begins to channel is first of all, his processing speed. And processing speed is a very interesting phenomenon because what happens is it develops early in childhood. And by about the age of five or six and certainly nine or 10 maximum, we reach a set point. And this set point doesn't usually change during the lifetime. And in Daryl's case, it actually went up when he began to channel. And it increased when he listened. The actual frequency of the processing speed was tuned to an exact frequency all over the brain. Now we're looking at the Daryl's anterior cingulate while he's channeling and you can see the red areas there, there is actually gamma frequencies that I found in his anterior cingulate. And gamma frequencies relate to the higher mind. And gamma frequencies are often found in Tibetan monks and people who meditate a lot. To summarize sort of what I found here in, in Daryl's brain in comparison with the channeling state, he starts from a very stable resting state and then he experiences changes that statistically less than 1% of the population would experience in the same way. He increases his processing speed. He tunes it exquisitely to one frequency all over the brain. And then he's able to create a resonant holding environment for the peak performance or the channeling to happen. Uh, he pumps energy into the right frontal cortex and the right auditory cortex so that he can empathize and, and hear very, very clearly. And because of the gamma frequencies in the anterior cingulate, he can shift gears. He'll be able to, to shift gears and navigate 
cognition, thoughts, and emotions very, very flexibly. And he'll be able to interpret from a higher perspective, from a more evolved place in his mind, much like from the highest mountaintop. When I first started channeling, the process of shifting into the altered state took a little longer than it does now. My breathing changed, taking in more oxygen to support Bashar's higher energy. I would also experience a spectrum of emotions as I slipped into the channeling state, as my energy rose in frequency on its way to synchronizing with Bashar's vibration. Flashes of anger, fear, and sadness gave way to hope, happiness, and love at which point our individual vibrations would harmonize. There was a period of a few years where I stopped channeling to pursue my film career. But when I resumed doing sessions, I was nearly overwhelmed by the emotional reconnection to Bashar's energy, and a wave of compassion washed over me. I felt like I was coming home. Most of the experience is like being in a very dynamic, very energetic daydream. And it's like, I don't really hear the words in the same way that if someone is really deeply in a daydream and somebody calls their name and it takes them five times to hear, it's kind of like that. I know there's an interaction going on, but it might as well be taking place in another room, in another house, somewhere else. And I know this is getting translated for someone through language. I'm acting kind of as a biological translator. My energy is sort of taking on the personality of Bashar. It's not like he's in me. There's no possession in that sense. But I'm locking with his frequency like a tuning fork. And by matching his frequency, you get a model, a representation, a symbol of his personality. Because he's not speaking English. He's not speaking any language at all. He's just sending thoughts. But because I'm operating on the same wavelength as I've been trained to do, I'm having the same thoughts at the same time. So I'm able in our culture to translate his ideas into our language. I'm focused on these pictures, these energy patterns. When he's talking to someone, I see all the different patterns that represent who they are, what their beliefs are, what their hopes are, their dreams are. And he's tapping into all sorts of different sources of information. He's tapping into their higher mind, into their memories. He's tapping into higher source, other beings from his world, other worlds. He's tapping into whatever he needs to, like a switchboard to bring the information through that answers the questions that they're asking. So I'm constantly feeling all these different energy webs and lines of information coming and going, like some sort of a galactic train station almost. And it just all coalesces in this, this telepathic hit that is sometimes represented by symbols, by abstract shapes, sometimes by literal images, but it's just coming so fast and furious and time is so collapsed for me that I, I can do nothing but just let it through and just sort of watch the show. And these things just kind of flow dynamically through me in such a way that I can't pay attention to anything else. I'm left a little disoriented at the moment because I have to sort of wake up from the dream and remember who I am and where I am. But once I'm back, I'm very energized. It's very supportive energy. Um, you know, in the beginning, it tired me out a little bit because there was unfamiliarity, there was resistance to the energy. I, I just didn't know how to handle it. I often say it's kind of like trying to shove Hoover Dam through a garden hose. But you know, once I let go, I relaxed, I trusted him, I sort of stretched <laughs> that way, those energy paths out, then it became very uplifting, it became very supportive. And now when I come out of it, I may not remember it, it may fade like a dream, but I retain the concepts I need to retain for me. It works for me as well. I can apply them in my life. But I don't really remember the conversation. I didn't hear it. I don't remember some of the images that I had. But I'm left with this feeling of balance, this feeling that everything's OK, this feeling of possibility, infinite probability. Um, and I just feel good. A lot of times, people will be coming to these sessions for years and years, and that develop a dialogue and a relationship with Bashar, but they've never actually introduced themselves to me until one day they'll come up and they'll start talking to me like I'm supposed to know who they are. It's like, I'm sorry, I have no clue who you are. <laughs> so it's kind of that sort of thing. Bashar. By the way, who gave you that name? 
I took a channeling class, not because I thought it was going to be a channel. I was just doing research into channeling. But it was a series of guided meditations. And in one of the meditations, the word Bashar was there. Now, I thought it was his name. He explained later that in their society, they're telepathic, they don't need names. He knew we needed to call him something, and so that word was there. I have since understood that part of the reason that word was chosen is because part, it's an Arabic word. I don't speak Arabic, but part of my background is Arabic. And the word, even though it's not his name, is representative of what he does. I was actually told a couple of years after I started channeling that the word Bashar means messenger or bringer of good news. Many of you recognize that there may seem to be, from one perspective, an acceleration of negativity, an acceleration of violence. But really, this is because you're at the end of the cycle of limitation and you have to get it all out on the table and deal with it now because there isn't that much time left to deal with these things. You have to get all of the negativity out on the table in front of your face so that you can consciously decide what kind of a world you really prefer to have. So now that you know you're strong enough to deal with it, you're getting it all out of your system as fast as you can, having the most extreme examples come up because you are strong enough to deal with it. So we call this the rubber band analogy. Fret not, despair not that you have experienced that degree of darkness, that degree of limitation, that degree of negativity. Because the farther back into darkness you pull the rubber band, when you finally let go, it's going to fly that much faster and that much farther into the light. The reason that many scientists are skeptical of reports of encounters with extraterrestrials is that many of the witnesses describe them as being humanoid. The skeptics explain that in a universe as vast as our own, with so many planets unlike the Earth, the odds of alien life resembling us are incredibly small. And in general, they're probably right. Bashar himself has said that most of the life that he's encountered throughout the galaxy they look nothing like us. I think the irony is that the skeptics have had the answer all along, but they've missed a vital clue. It's probably true that most alien life doesn't look like us. And therefore, if the reports of extraterrestrial humanoids are factual, it may be that these beings are not really alien. Assuming for the moment that Bashar is real, who is he? Where does he come from? Why is he making contact with Earth? The story of my people began in a parallel reality on an alternate version of Earth. The humans on that Earth were technologically far in advance of the humans in your civilization. However, they became focused on technology and intellect. Over generations, they lost connection to their humanity. They lost the ability to feel. They even lost the ability to reproduce. They engineered love out of their lives. They accomplished great technological and intellectual feats at the expense of their emotions, their physical bodies, and their spiritual qualities which they considered to be inferior. But in doing so, they slowly destroyed their environment in a last desperate attempt to perpetuate their species, they moved underground and began to clone themselves, but discovered that their DNA was no longer viable. When the attempt to clone themselves failed, they genetically mutated themselves into the beings you know as the Greys in an attempt to adapt to their dying planet. However, they realized that the only solution would be to find a viable source of human DNA and introduce it back into their genetic makeup. They used their advanced technology to shift into parallel realities, such as your own, where they knew that humans must still exist. But without emotions, they had no understanding of the fearful impact they would have as they abducted your people and extracted DNA in order to create our hybrid civilizations which took centuries to complete. We were designed to bring emotionality and spirituality, vitality and balance back into the gray civilization to reconnect more fully with creation so their culture would never die out. 
Although many of your people experienced these encounters with the Greys traumatically at first, we are grateful that you chose to help bring our civilization into being. In our appreciation, we share our knowledge and experience with you, with the vision that your world will choose a more positive outcome than the Greys, for we perceive that you have been traveling down a similar path. If it's true that the destruction of their parallel Earth gave rise to the beings we call the Greys, can we use that knowledge to change our path? or will we ultimately choose to suffer the same fate? We must all answer this question for ourselves. While our civilization was being created, the Greys found a suitable planet in their parallel reality and with the help of their advanced technology, they transformed it into our homeworld that became Essasani. We have many forms of animal life. Along with us, plants and animals were brought to our world from many different worlds throughout the galaxy in order to create a balanced system in which we could reside. Some of these forms of life even came from your own world. Our world remains in a natural state. We do not build permanent structures on the surface. Our spaceships are our cities, and from within those ships, we can explore the vast unknown. We invite you to join us on this journey of discovery. Considering the vast distances between the stars, how would ETs travel from one system to another so quickly? Many scientists still believe there's no way an ET could get to Earth in a short amount of time. Perhaps it's time to bury that outdated concept, just as the following ideas once considered facts were ultimately proven to be false. The concept of faster-than-light travel is no longer as far-fetched as it used to be. Scientists like physicist Miguel Alcubierre and NASA engineer Harold Sonny White have developed a model for a Star Trek-like warp drive that would warp the fabric of space and propel a ship to the nearest star in under two weeks, rather than the thousands of years it would take with our present rocket technology. A civilization, a thousand or even a few hundred years ahead of ours, could already possess such technology. In one dream, I experienced myself being on the ship that I saw, with Bashar standing there looking at me, and I was able to sort of look around the ship, and it was all kind of this, I don't know, frosted, crystalline-type material. I saw another member of his species sitting at a control console, but I didn't see any controls. And he telepathically explained to me in the dream that their ships are actually artificially intelligent. And in fact, they're actually a representation of their own higher minds. And that the pilot is actually telepathically linked with the ship, they communicate. And so only the pilot can see the controls, which struck me as kind of like really cool and really efficient because no one else can fly that ship, but the pilot 
that's connected to the ship. Even though you are unto yourself a beautiful oasis in the sea of stars that is your galaxy, you are not as isolated as you may think. Traveling to your world is not so difficult. We can travel more slowly if we wish through the manipulation of electromagnetic and gravitic fields. The idea, however, of going from star system to star system happens in a very different way. While you think of an object as existing in a location, to us, location is one of the properties of the object. If you thus then have an object at point A, and you are able to isolate it with an energy bubble, in a sense, unlock it from any particular reality, and thus then impose upon it the vibrational signature frequency of location B, it must stop existing at location A and instantaneously start taking up residence at location B without actually having traveled the intervening distance. You have actually changed its locational variable in its energy signature. If this is an accurate description, then an extraterrestrial civilization with this technology would be capable of traveling light years in the blink of an eye. Thus, the distances between the stars would no longer be a barrier to interaction with other worlds such as Earth. To some degree, we've addressed the first two questions about Bashar who he is and where he comes from. But the answer to the third question, why is he here? Could herald one of the greatest events in human history, open contact with a civilization from another world. I just hope to God they're friendly and I hope we could communicate and become friends. I'd say, hey, welcome. I figure that if they have the wherewithal to get here, they probably drop their craziness behind. Hopefully that's a natural law. If you can escape the planets or go to other planets, you got to be kind and loving and have something to offer. The opportunity to hear the perspective and to witness um, the being of somebody who had been anywhere other than here would be fascinating. It would just keep me interested in what humans are. You know, because the more we can look at how we are in the context of the life around us, the more we understand ourselves. So by looking at life on another planet, I think we could just learn a lot about what life is. We do not mean this in a judgmental or negative way. We are to some degree joking a little bit. But why would we want to land in an insane asylum where all the inmates have guns? There have been occasions when people in your society in these interactions have said, Bashar, I know I'm ready. I'm ready to meet you today, right now. Well, all right, there have been a few occasions where we have agreed to see if that's so. And we have named the place and we have named the time that our ship will land. And those people have been there. And as soon in all occasions they see or sense that our ship is approaching, that our energy is growing, they run in great fear. A lot of people wonder, why don't they land? Why don't they just reveal themselves? Now Bashar has explained that a lot of civilizations that are more advanced, more integrated than ours, operate on a very high frequency level of energy. And because we tend to compartmentalize things in our consciousness, because we give in to negative definitions, fear-based definitions, our energy is kind of erratic, random, and sort of of a lower frequency more often than not. And he's likened the idea to gears. So a higher frequency race will operate at like a fast spinning gear. And a, lower frequency civilization will be like a very slowly turning gear. And if you jam those two gears together too quickly, you'll strip the gears. 
they have to be more synchronized before you can put them together. So basically the way Bashar showed me this is in a dream I saw his ship land and I saw him get out and I saw him walk toward me. And as soon as he got, I don't know, maybe 10, 20 feet away, I actually suddenly lost my identity and I saw my body through his eyes as if I became him, as if I was absorbed by him. And he said, see, that's why. It's like our energy is so much more overwhelming at this high frequency than yours is that it, it can actually overpower your sense of identity. You're not fully integrated enough to sort of hold your own. So we are delivering information to you in the way that we are so that you absorb it at your own rate. You change at your own rate when you're ready to integrate. You upgrade your frequency when you're ready. And when you upgrade your frequency enough, when you kind of meet us halfway, then our energies will be harmonized and synchronized. And you won't experience this sort of loss of identity or give your power over to us. If we do it too soon, too prematurely, we're not really doing you any favors. We'll actually be very disruptive to not only your society, but to you as an individual. So the more you change, the more you grow, the more you become more of yourself, the more you'll be like us, the more compatible we'll be vibrationally, and the more we can interact physically. And that's when contact will occur. This, for us, is how contact begins by the dissemination of ideas, reflections, and information that give you the opportunity to absorb them at your own pace, in your own timing, at your own discretion, for we force no ideas upon you. If the messages delivered by Bashar are intended to expand our awareness and prepare us for physical contact, what kind of information do the messages contain? To understand Bashar's messages, it's important to upgrade old and outdated definitions into ones that are more relevant for the 21st century. Many of Bashar's concepts require us to expand our awareness. If we can perceive reality in the same way that ETs experience it, we create common ground and it brings us one step closer to physical contact. The foundational information is what we have referred to as the five laws of creation. The five laws are, you exist. Number two, everything is here and now. Number three, the one is the all and the all are the one. Number four, what you put out is what you get back. And number five, everything changes except the first four laws. They're not the laws of physics, which can change from dimension to dimension. These are the laws of existence, the very definition of the structure of existence, which is true for everyone, everywhere, in every reality, at every time, throughout creation. They never change. Every experience any of you have ever had, are having now, or will ever have, is some combination of those five laws once you understand with clarity that foundation, you will understand exactly how existence works. You will understand exactly how to create the realities that you prefer. Physical reality is a reflection of your state of being, your state of consciousness. There really is nothing out side of you, you're not really in physical reality. Physical reality is within you. It's within your consciousness. It is a concept that you are experiencing of yourself from a certain perspective. However, we understand that the way in which you have chosen to experience your particular dimension of physical experience is as though you are within a realm of space and time, as you call it, where you have taken your energy, the energy, the high frequency energy of your spirit nature, and in a sense, have lowered that frequency, crystallized that frequency down into what you call the experience of physical reality. So the thing to remember in order to give yourself more opportunity 
to choose and experience the kind of physical reality you prefer is to begin to see and experience physical reality as a reflection, similar to the idea of the reflection that exists in your glass mirrors. You know that when you look at your reflection in a glass mirror, you know that you're not really over there. And you know that if you want to change the reflection in the glass mirror, you don't go to the reflection and attempt to make it change. You must change yourself in order to see the change in the reflection. So physical reality, being a reflection, operates in much the same kind of modality. Any change you wish to see in the so-called reflection, the outer reality, must begin within, must begin within the inner reality, which is you, within your consciousness, within your vibration, within your state of being. It is all based on state of being. There is nothing in physical reality that is not. It doesn't matter that there might be a physicalized component or a physicalized reflection that you call chemistry or physics or medicine or science. Those are still just reflections of what you already believe in your consciousness to be true for you. Yes? Yes. So it's all based on belief. It's all based on consciousness. It's all based on vibration. It's all based on resonance. It's all based on state of being. That's why we say, circumstances do not matter. Only state of being does. Because it's state of being that creates circumstances. Circumstances don't create state of being. It's the other way around. You never leave heaven, if you want a metaphor. You never, ever, ever leave that state. That's your natural state. You are all only dreaming that you've left, but you're still there, having this dream there. You understand? You've all gone to sleep in heaven and are dreaming you're in hell. <laughs> We are sometimes asked why people choose to incarnate in physical reality on Earth. And there are as many reasons as there are people. But generally speaking, it's an exciting place to be, especially now in this age of transformation. Many people want to experience the idea of change and discovery. Remember that in a timeless state, you cannot experience change. You cannot experience discovery of new perspectives. So by forgetting, in essence, who you are as a spirit, as a greater being, you can learn through a process of physical space-time reality how to rediscover yourself anew from a different perspective. And when you create the idea of the space-time framework, you give yourself an opportunity to experience the process of creation. Time is, in a sense, an illusion, even though the experience of time is real. But the idea is that time is a side effect, a side effect of your consciousness, shifting through billions of parallel realities per second. Parallel realities are like frozen snapshots, like frames of film. They have no movement in and of themselves. And like your film, the only way to create the illusion of time and movement is to project a light through the different frames onto a screen one after the other in such a manner as to create that illusion because no frame has movement in and of itself. If you weren't shifting through parallel realities billions of times a second, you would have absolutely no experience of change whatsoever. Everything would be a frozen snapshot, like this. <laughs> or perhaps like this. <laughs> or maybe like this. <laughs> but you have to, like frames on a film strip, actually project your consciousness, like the light of the projector, through a multitude of frames per second in order to actually experience the illusion uh, of any particular time stream. This is how reality works. And so as you shift your consciousness like the projector beam, through those different frames of parallel realities, you are creating this experience of change and time and space. 
But the idea is that all those frames exist all at once. Just like the projectionist can take a strip of film and stretch it out and look at all the frames simultaneously and look at them in any order, the only reason that the projectionist can do that is because all the frames exist now, simultaneously, all at once. The idea that they come one after another is simply your projection, your illusion. Therefore, the true structure of existence is that everything exists all at once. To use your television analogy, you know that if you are watching a program on one channel, there are still hundreds of other programs that exist at the same time, but you only perceive the one that you are tuned to. So the idea is that if you wish to experience change, if you wish to experience a different kind of reality, a different way of experiencing space and time, all you need to do is shift to a different parallel reality that already exists simultaneously with yours, just like changing the channel on your television to see a different program that exists at the same time as the one you were just watching that is still going on even though you have changed the channel and can no longer perceive it. A set of principles is a start, but can we apply these principles as tools to change our lives and our society in positive and practical ways? Every single one of you talks about the idea of applying some sort of tool or technique to make changes in your lives in a positive and constructive way. And we have had many discussions with many of you about the idea of exactly what sort of tools to apply and how to apply them and how to get a result and how to get a manifestation. Now, of course, first and foremost, you are always manifesting something. If you were not, you wouldn't have an experiential physical reality, correct? Correct. So the idea is, you do not have to learn how to manifest. This is automatic. It is built into you as a creator, as an aspect of creation. What you are simply learning is how to manifest more consciously, to be more aware of how you manifest so that you can manifest what you prefer, instead of manifesting your unconscious beliefs. Passion and all of its expressions, excitement, happiness, joy, creativity, love, are all different ways of expressing the vibration, of your true natural self, what we call your signature frequency. Your signature frequency is that resonant energy, that vibration that is unique to you, that identifies you as a unique aspect of all that is of creation. And the way you apply that signature frequency through passion is to act on your highest excitement to the best of your ability with no insistence or assumption as to what the outcome ought to be, as to what to come to fruition, but to allow the synchronicity in your life to present to you the opportunities that contain that excitement so you can recognize it because excitement is the compass needle that points to your magnetic north and by acting on it to the best of your ability, you will bring about in your life what we call the complete kit. You will allow it to work for you. And you will discover very readily, very easily, that excitement can function in your life as the driving engine, as the organizing principle, as the path of least resistance, as the thread that leads to all other expressions of excitement, and as the reflective mirror that will reveal to you what may be within you that is out of alignment with that excitement so you can identify it and bring it back into alignment and expand your excitement in that way. And simply by following that formula, of acting at every moment to the best of your ability on your highest excitement with no insistence on how the outcome should look, you will activate that complete kit and it will work for you automatically 
effortlessly, every moment, without fail. As you allow yourself to move forward in that way, your life will become an ecstatic explosion of synchronicity, very magical. Things will begin to happen all around you because magic is, again, the true nature of existence. Miracles are the natural order of things, not the exception. Remember, no situation has built-in meaning. Everything is fundamentally neutral. Life is meaningless. You're the one that's designed to give life meaning. If you give situations a positive meaning, you will get a beneficial positive effect. If you give them a negative definition, you can only get an effect that is representative of negativity, such as struggle, strife, difficulty, and obstacle. You only see it that way because you're defining it that way. Change your definition, you'll experience things in a very different way. That's how it works. What you put out is what you get back. Creating definitions that work for you. When you look at the idea of what you call great darkness, great negativity, let's see, let's use the imagination, let's use the inspiration. How can I define my relationship to this idea in a way that serves me in a positive context? Oh, I don't know, let's see. Ah, there's always that wonderful rubber band analogy. The darker you've experienced the darkness, when you finally let go, that much farther and faster will you fly into the light. That's how to look at the idea of that experience of negativity in a positive way. Abundance. The, the abundance. ability to do what you need to do when you need to do it. No matter in what form the abundance comes, the abundance will give you the ability to do what you need to do when you need to do it. Not what you want to do, what you need to do. Consider these statements. I lack trust. I lack abundance. I lack confidence. There is no such thing as a lack of trust. There is no such thing as a lack of confidence. There is no such thing as a lack of abundance. There is, however, a 100% trust in lack. There is, however, 100% confidence in lack. There is, however, complete abundance of lack. The idea, therefore, is that you are always abundant, you are always trusting, you're always confident about something. It's about learning to be abundant in what you prefer to be, learning to be confident about what you prefer to be, learning to trust what you prefer to trust. It is now all the rage on your planet, the law of attraction. <clears throat> and while it is true, in a sense, that yes, you cannot experience something that you are not the vibration of and that you really do need to operate on a frequency that is representative of what it is you wish to attract, there is a little bit of a misunderstanding in exactly how this so-called law of attraction actually works. Because again, it's giving you the impression in the way that you've been framing it that you have to learn to generate that frequency, and you don't. You already generate the perfect frequency to attract everything that is truly necessary in your life. Many of you, because again of the way you've been taught to define things in your physical reality, have this kind of a picture in your head that when you vibrate in a certain way, you are attracting something from somewhere else to here. And that when you release something else, you are releasing it, so to speak, from here to somewhere else. Well, of course, many of you now understand that everything exists right here and now. It's not really coming from anywhere else or going to anywhere else. It is, in a sense, simply being rearranged as a ratio of energy, as a balance of energy, as an equation of energy within the consciousness that you are. So the way that this law of attraction and manifestation actually works is to recognize 
that you are already giving off, already radiating a core signature vibration. And that core signature vibration is already doing everything it can possibly do to attract everything that is representative of that particular frequency. If the things that are representative of that particular frequency are not manifesting in your life, it's not because you're not attracting them, it's because your beliefs are keeping them at bay. So it's not that you have to learn to attract them, it's that you have to learn to let go of vibrations that are not compatible with your core frequency that are keeping those things from getting to you, from manifesting in your reality. And conversely, all the things that are not compatible with your core vibration are doing their best to get as far away from you as they possibly can. The only reason they may not be is because you're holding on to them and not letting them go. So the law of attraction is really not necessarily about having to learn to attract something. The law of attraction is really all about letting go and letting in. That's really all it's about. It's about being yourself, living in the moment, being your true vibration, and then allowing the things that are representative of that vibration to manifest in your life, physically. The excitement that Bashar generates when he comes through and captivates an audience is most heartwarming. His impeccable timing and his ability to get to the root of a questioner's issue is quite extraordinary. Time after time, I see people have profound life-changing experiences as they hear Bashar explain that it's okay to be your true self and to act on your passion. It's really fascinating to see all the positive ways that Bashar's messages have impacted people's lives. One of the results of acting on your passion is an increase in positive synchronicity where everything happens in perfect timing. I got into the film industry specifically because I wanted to work in miniature effects for sci-fi films, for action films. This was very exciting to me. And I went around knocking on doors, but I couldn't really find an opening. Just about that time, Star Wars came out, and I went to see it, and it completely blew me away, like it did for so many people. And I knew that once I saw that film, I really had to get into the business. One day I was reading the newspaper, and a local theater that was playing Star Wars said if anyone will come down to the theater and help them handle the tremendous lines, they would hire that person on the spot. So I ran down to the theater and got the job because I figured if I was an usher at the theater while helping them handle the lines, I could watch the movie as many times as I wanted to and really study how they did those effects. One day, out of all of the three months that I worked at this theater, I took tickets at the door for one 20-minute period. One of the technicians from Star Wars came to the theater to see the movie. I recognized him and struck up a conversation, and he was responsible for getting me an interview that allowed me to get hired at a special effects company. If I hadn't acted on my passion, I never would have met him, I never would have made the connection, and I never would have gotten into the industry that way. Following your excitement and acting on your highest joy shows you how all things are connected and leads you down the proper path to allow synchronicity to occur and manifest your dreams. It's also interesting that following my passion to work in the film business, before I even knew about Bashar, has given me the skills to blend filmmaking and channeling in order to present this information in a broader way than ever before. Bashar says everything is an orchestration, so I've come to understand that the choices I made are part of my agreement with him and may be part of a larger plan leading to first contact. Some people will recognize me out in public and they'll call me Bashar instead of Daryl. It's kind of funny, but it's also kind of endearing. Who knows? Maybe answering to that name will help me become my own version of him, which is really just another way of saying that I'm becoming more my true self. I feel like Bashar represents what we could all become. We often say we're only human, but maybe we're not, not yet. Maybe we don't really know what it means to be fully human. Perhaps Bashar is showing us how to express our humanity more fully. If we act from our highest aspirations, restore what we've lost, reconnect and work in harmony with nature, develop cleaner ways to power our world, help each other to thrive, and find our true place in life, we can walk a new path that leads to a brighter future. 
contact is an ongoing experience and part of the natural evolution of you as a species from what you may loosely call homo sapiens to homo galacticus. Oh, if an alien civilization uh, came to visit us, I think that, that would be a pretty big shock uh, for the planet, obviously. I think that in order for us to even accept that into our reality, uh, we will have had to have gone to a place where crazy things happen all the time. Things to the point where if an alien shows up, oh, it's just part of the new normal. Once we acknowledge that extraterrestrials do exist, that they have technology that can get them here, however that may be, the idea we have behind how we power our civilization through energy and electrical power will drastically change because if we acknowledge that their ships get here and have propulsion systems that uh, do not require fossil fuels, uh, then our own ideas as what we think we know about physics will change. Eventually, if we receive some visitor from another galaxy has come. Look, same human being. <laughs> Maybe a little different sort of shapes. <laughs> oh. But basically same. Then furthermore, same sentient being. Respect them. 50% of Earth's population is under 30 years old. So humans have been in space longer than these people have been alive. To this generation and all generations to come, space travel is a fact of life. Over a thousand planets outside our solar system have been discovered within the last two decades. The probability of discovering another world capable of supporting life as we know it is increasing every day. The concept of alien contact is no longer foreign to our society. The question isn't if it will happen, but when. This new collective mindset may be all the invitation an extraterrestrial society needs to initiate contact with us. However, devastating encounters between European explorers and Native American cultures are often used as examples of what could happen to our society in the aftermath of contact with a more advanced ET culture. But it is precisely because they may be more advanced than us that they would take steps to make sure no harm is done to our way of life. Because we are genetically connected to you, we are family. For we are, in that sense, your descendants, and you are our ancestors. And thus, our deep, deep connection to you as family is profound. By interaction through open contact, our family grows. We expand each other, we support each other, we grow together, and together we grow into something that neither of us individually can ever become. How can we, on Earth, best prepare for contact? You have a wonderful and unique opportunity on your planet to recognize that you are living side by side with other sentient species. The dolphins are, in many ways, one of the most similar sentient species to your own. We may be extraterrestrial because we don't come from your world, but because we are genetically related to you, we are not really alien. Conversely, the dolphins are not extraterrestrial because they co-inhabit your world with you. They truly are alien to you. Thus, by being willing to interact with them, and learn to communicate with them, it will actually give you a great opportunity to learn to communicate with other life forms out in the cosmos that truly are alien to you. In exploring Bashar's suggestion, I developed a strong passion for swimming with wild dolphins and whales, and found that being with them offers you the opportunity to enter a state of consciousness that's actually quite similar to the channeling state. From that state, you can access more information and actually see things from a higher perspective. But do dolphins and whales possess actual languages? 
Some researchers are beginning to think so. I, I work at the SETI Institute, and what I'm going to present is basically an application of information theory to non-human communication. I'll present one kind of a way of analyzing, and it's a very simple relationship that's a linguistic relationship, and that's called Ziff's Law. A linguist in the early 50s basically decided to plot the frequency of occurrence of different letters in books. And he plotted the log of the frequency of occurrence in rank order, in other words, first, second, third, fourth, and so on. And he said the frequency of occurrence of the letter E is the most, then I'll plot the frequency of the occurrence of the letter T in the book, and then the letter A, and on down. And he found a relationship that was basically minus one slope. In other words, a slope of minus one gives you a 45 degree angle. And he did this for letters, and he did it for Chinese characters, and he did it for various phonemes, Russian phonemes. It turns out all human languages produce this minus one slope. And uh, so what we did is we compiled a, a dictionary of bottomless dolphins, or whistle communication system, and we plotted their frequency of occurrence. And we got a minus one slope for dolphins as well. And then what happened was two baby dolphins were born at Marine World, and we recorded them with my colleague Brendan McCowan. For humans, uh, when babies are born, they babble, and they produce a kind of a shallow slope. And it turns out that the baby dolphins were babbling as well. They landed right on top of human babbling. And as they grew up, about after about 12 months, they had this minus one slope. So in other words, we, we determine that baby dolphins are born babbling and then learn it as they grow up. Based on this information, dolphins have a language. Dolphins have interacted with your society in many ways. Dolphins have guided ships through the seas. Dolphins have saved drowning swimmers. Dolphins have even sought humans out. When they are injured, they truly wish to bond with you. They truly are expressing a desire to interact. Swimming alongside the dolphins, you see not only this incredible beauty and grace that they exhibit, but you experience a deep sense of freedom, of the limitlessness of their ocean world, and a sense of kinship with them. It's like they invite you to become one with them, to become part of their family. Not only does this help people find a clearer sense of their life purpose, it also gives them the opportunity to learn to communicate with another species, one very different from our own. And this can actually act as a precursor and a preparation for the experience of having extraterrestrial contact. Humans are stewards of the land. The dolphins and the whales are stewards of the sea. Take advantage of this great opportunity that you have co-created with them to learn to communicate with other species in a variety of ways. It will aid and assist you in communications with other beings throughout creation. When we talk about the idea of having open contact with you, we are not just talking about having open contact with humans. Open contact is with all life on your planet and you will become truly one society in a variety of differences that are validated and supported to form a true harmony and unity upon your world. If we can learn to communicate with an intelligent species on Earth that's so different from us, perhaps it will not only help us understand beings from the stars, but to respect the differences among ourselves as well. Over the course of my interactions with the public, people have reacted to the channeling in various ways. Some think I'm imagining all this, or worse, making it up. They say truth goes through three stages. First, it's ridiculed. Second, it's violently opposed. And third, 
It's finally accepted as self-evident. The fact is, I'm just an ordinary person who experienced something extraordinary. I think these people don't understand my experience because they've never had such things happen to them, so they believe they can't happen to anyone. When people come back to me and say, you know, I, I applied this information the way Bashar told it to me, it solved this problem, it cleared this thing up, it gave me a whole new perspective, it allowed me to feel like I was in control, it allowed me to experience the outcome that I really preferred to experience, I mean, that's very gratifying. And it, it tells me that this is real on that level. I think that's the important thing to understand is it's not about whether people believe that Bashar is real, it's not about whether this is another aspect of my own consciousness. It's, is the information real? Can you prove that it works? And yes, you can. I've applied it in my life and gotten amazing results. Other people keep telling me that they've applied it and it works for them. It changes things in very positive ways. They see more synchronicity in their life. They feel more positive in general. They do better at what they do. They're following their passion more often and living happier lives. The concepts that Bashar brings through make you think. They make you question your life, question what reality is. Bashar has taught me that what I believe about life, what I feel about it, what I think about it, is what creates my life. You know, Bashar encourages us to do what excites us and to follow our dreams. And because of his insights and encouragement, I've accomplished things I never thought I could do. Bashar has helped me personally through not only his unwavering support of me following my passion, but also through many, many years of him giving me guidance. And really, just the experience of what it means to be unconditionally loved by another person has had a profound effect on me. Bashar is someone that I deeply trust and respect and he's earned that respect. He has shown me how you really can generate a positive outcome, no matter how negative or difficult a situation may look from the outside. And he's also shown me the incredible levels of happiness, well-being, and inspiration that you can experience right here on Earth when you're willing to follow your excitement and actively create the life that you dream of. I have learned things I never believed I would have learned, never imagined were possible to experience. I've certainly traveled to many different places on the earth I probably never would have gone to if it wasn't for the channeling. It's really enriched my life in a lot of different ways. So I think that anyone who has an opportunity to follow a path that's unusual, uh, even if people think you're crazy, I think the rewards outweigh anyone else's opinion. And, you know, you don't always know where you're going to wind up, and that's okay. That's part of the adventure. Um, so I'd say go for it because the alternative is to wonder what would have happened. And um, I'd rather go forward and be called crazy than to look back and say I have a regret that I never followed that path. Bashar has explained that contact will happen in stages over time so that we're better prepared and that one day, when we're ready, open contact may look something like this. Whether or not you believe ETs are already communicating with Earth through channels or via other types of encounters, we are nevertheless at the dawn of a new era of exploration, not only of the vast outer universe, but also of our deep inner consciousness. If Bashar and other ETs are in fact real, two questions remain. 
When is open physical contact likely to occur? And will we be ready when that day comes? You are going to make a discovery whereby your people will know that it is a fact that extraterrestrial life exists in some way, shape, or form. But no matter what that form may be, that will change the mindset that will make open contact from an extraterrestrial civilization with your world most probable between your years of 2025 to 2033. There have been, from time to time, certain encounters. Not everything that you may see is a ship. Not every experience that may seem to be otherworldly is necessarily representative of us or those like us. As far as UFO sightings go, the primary ones that you need to recognize are the sightings that you have called the Phoenix Lights over your Arizona area. Similar craft were spotted in the area you call your Hudson Valley on the east coast of your United States. And waves of triangular craft were spotted in the area you call Belgium. They have showed you their craft, and they have gauged the reaction. So far, the official reaction has been mostly one of denying it ever happened. relationship between your world and other world grows, you will venture out to the stars yourself, and you will visit other worlds, and you will become their UFOs. It has been a kind of a misunderstanding in certain cultures on your planet that the idea of having a unified world a harmonious world means that you all have to be homogenized. That is as far from unity as you can get. True harmony, true unity, is the product of absolute validation of all of the individual differences between you. Because each of you was made to be a unique piece of the puzzle. And like a piece of a puzzle picture, if you are the shape you were made to be, then you will fit with all the other unique shapes and together form one big picture that will support all the pieces, even as the pieces support the whole picture. So if you just relax into the true unique self and validate all the differences between you fully, then you will all see that you are like different notes of an orchestration. You will all fit and play a beautiful song that will surround your world. And in that bubble will you find the harmony and unity that you seek. For centuries, we've asked the question, are we alone? If something as impossible as an encounter with a UFO can happen, then I feel the universe is more mysterious than I imagined and that maybe anything is possible. I've learned that contact isn't just about people from other worlds coming to Earth in the future. It's much bigger than that. I believe the experience of contact is part of evolution itself. By shifting to a higher state of awareness through channeling, acting on my passion and being open to new definitions of reality, I've come to realize that beings from the stars have always been here. The truth is, we've never really been alone.